last week we had some massive tides and on three of those tides the low water reading actually fell below what is known as chart datum. Now for those of you that don't know what I mean when I say chart datum, let's imagine that's a tide line with a reading of zero. Now most times in a year or even more than a year the tide will rarely fall below that line and anything below that line is usually underwater. But on occasions it does and when it does it gives a fantastic opportunity to get out and do some foraging and I managed to get out for one of those tides last week and what I decided to see if I could find is some scallops and some oysters and when it comes to finding the scallops because the tide was going back a lot further than it would normally do there was a chance that scallops that would normally remain hidden underwater would be exposed and it was just a case of if I could find some would they be big enough big enough for me to take home to eat but when it comes to the oysters although a big spring a big tide is very useful of course I don't necessarily need such a big tide because the oysters can be found further up the tide line so we'll have a look at how I got on, but what I have to say is that on this particular occasion it was very, very windy. In fact, there was winds to 40 miles an hour. I was hoping I might be able to get a bit of shelter, but I couldn't. So when I got there, I decided um, not to, 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 to try and do any live commentary in, the, in those winds, but to just film it and then I'll put voiceover on afterwards. But you will hear on occasions how windy it was. The first thing I wanted to see if I could find is scallops, which are most likely to be found close to the low water mark. So it's just a matter of wandering the beach close to the water's edge to see if any have been exposed by the falling tide. You can hear how windy it was even with a windshield. It looked like it was going to be my lucky day, as it didn't take long before I found a scallop exposed close to the water's edge. They tend to sit in hollows in the sand or mud. The size limit in Cornwall is 10 centimetres measured across the widest part. And although I could see this was definitely big enough, a measure just to make sure. So that was a great start. It was about an hour before low water, therefore plenty of time to find more. Definitely my lucky day and another well over the size limit. These scallops, known as great scallops or king scallops, can grow up to about 15 centimetres wide. The shell is flat one side and rounded the other. The smaller queen scallop can grow up to about 9 centimetres wide. And both shells are rounded. The size limit for the, for the smaller queen scallop in Cornwall is, is only 4 centimetres. Another scallop here, and this is a great view of the inside where you can see the frills at the edge of the shell and the edible white meat and orange row inside. Another one for the pot. The plan was to carry on looking for scallops until the tide turned, then collect some oysters. But just pause in here to show you what a native oyster looks like with its rounded shell. Later you will see the difference between the native oyster and the invasive Pacific oyster. This is edible seaweed known as sugar kelp. Live in, it can be found and harvested at the low water mark on big tides and it's great to eat. Another edible seaweed here known as sea lettuce, found just about everywhere and again great to eat. The last scallop found here just as the tide was turning. So that's great, four keeper scallops, which is a great session. Now to find some oysters. There are two types of oysters here, the native that I've shown you and the invasive Pacific. I'm mainly after the Pacific, but this is another native with its rounded shape. Once you've done this a few times, you get an eye for spotting them, just sitting in the mud or attached to a piece of weed. Okay, the first Pacific Oyster.
you can clearly see the difference in shape to the native. The Pacific pear-shaped and the native round-shaped. Another Pacific here just sitting in the mud. And another. In the right location these are easy to find free food. So some great scallops, a few oysters and some edible seaweed. Back home now to sort them out. Well back home now and there's our scallops and there's our oysters and you can clearly see the difference between the invasive Pacific oyster and our native oyster a totally totally different shape. Now I've only taken two of the native oysters I could have taken a lot more there was plenty down there but I've only taken two but mainly taken the invasive Pacific oyster. So what I've done I've given these a good wash and a scrub to get all the bits of weed off and all the mud off but I haven't got time to deal with them any more today. I haven't got time to cook any of them today. So what I'm going to do is keep them in the fridge overnight, covered with a damp cloth, and that will keep them nice and fresh. Now when it comes to oysters, the commercially caught oysters, the commercially dredged oysters, would be treated before they're sold to the public. They'll be treated to kill, out, kill off any bacteria because most of the uh, commercially caught oysters eaten by the public will be eaten raw. Not all of them, but most of them will be eaten raw. But there's no way I'm going to take a chance and eat any of these oysters raw. So, what, they, what's going to, what I'm going to do is actually cook them. And the cooking process will kill off the bacteria, but as a double precaution, I'm actually going to freeze them. So tomorrow, when I've got time, I'll shut them, and then just, and that will, just to make sure that they're, that they're okay, that they are alive, shut them and then I'm going to freeze them and then when I'm ready when I've got time and I'm ready to cook them they'll be cooked so double so it'll be double precaution frozen and then and cooked as well but if I did want to eat any of these oysters today what I would probably do is drop them into boiling water for a short while first then then take them out of their shell and then cook them the way I'm going to cook them Okay, so we'll get these in the fridge, covered in the cloth, and then tomorrow I'll sort them out. All right, so the scallops and the oysters have been kept in the fridge overnight, and now I've got the time to deal with them. But the, the first thing I'm going to deal with is the scallops. And as always, just the same as mussels, just got to check that they're, they're still alive, that the shells are closed. But if, they, if there are any that are open, what we've got to do, just like a mussel, just give them a tap, and as long as they close, they're, they're absolutely fine. Now, I'm no expert when it comes to shucking scallops and oysters. But this is the way I like to do scallops. So I've got a blunt kitchen knife to open it up. And while I'm, as many of you will know, that I've eaten scallops, that's the bit I want. That beautiful bit of meat there like that. I've already done some. Um, you can also eat the, the roe, which is this bit here. Um, but what, I'm, what I want, the way I'm, what I'm going to do as regards cooking these, I'm just going to cook, cook that bit. And I may use the roes uh, for something else. All right, so take the blunt knife. Now you can go in, you can try and go in at the front there, but it's a lot easier in my opinion to go in at the back here by this hinge where, you, as you can see, there's more of a gap and therefore it's easier to get the knife in. So we just go in there and just give it a twist. And that's what we're looking for, just to open up the shell enough so you can, so you can wedge it open and then just going to take the blunt knife and just remove, scrape the meat off of the shell. And what you've got on this side, I hope you can just see it in there, there's a bit of white muscle 
which is attached to the shell. So you sort of run, run the knife under that, and once you do that, then it then it will come away easily, like that. Looks a bit of a mess at the moment, doesn't it? Right, so that's the bit we're after. So now all I've, what I've got to do is is just scrape this away from from this part of the shell. Like that. Oh, now the messy bit. And that is to, it's pretty obvious what's, what's not edible. You've got all these gungy bits here, these, what they call the frills that we're not going to eat. So, without making a complete hash of it, I'm just going to pull all this, these bits, gungy bits, away from that lovely bit of white meat. With a bit of luck, I should end up with that piece there. I just pull, just pull these these mucky bits off of that. Uh, oops, that's half the trouble. It, it, it's so it gets so slippery, and you've got this this bit here, which has got which has got a bit of a, a, a mucky bit. This bit of muscle, you can just ease that off. And basically, that's it. When I give, when I give them a wash, I'll just clean, clean them up a bit better. Those little brown bits there. And that's it. Fantastic. Into some water. And I'll give it a wash in a minute. And I say the row bit, um, yeah, great, you can eat them. Um, and I will eat them separately. Just remove all of this. And there you go, you've got the row as well. Now, these waste bits, what they call the frills, I'm not going to be wasted. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put them all in a freezer bag, pop them in the freezer, and with a bit of luck, later on in the year, this these might catch me a gilt head bream. Either bind, bind it with bait elastic, and then pop it on the hook, just the same as I would do, let's say, razor clam, or maybe, maybe as a tipping bait. Yeah, I might, as I say, if I'm lucky, Catch me a gilt head bream, but definitely worth worth keeping as bait. Right, just got to get this clean, all cleaned up now, and then I'll move on and do the do the oysters. So that's the scallops done. So I've got my four fantastic pieces of scallop meat all cleaned up and ready now to eat later. I've kept the rows, which I'll probably have maybe just just quickly fry them and have them on a bit of toast uh, as a treat. Got my scallop frills, all the waste bagged up to be frozen, to be using as, used as bait later on in the year. And I've kept the shells for the moment, just in case I decide I want to use them as a serving dish. So move on now and sort the oysters out. Now for the oysters, I've got myself a proper oyster shucking knife. So, on a towel, got the oyster with the rounded side down and using the towel to hold on to it, it's going with the, the shucking knife at the back here at the hinge and in and twist. Now I must admit I don't find this easy but eventually you get in and you in and then twist and there we go. And Got it open, and then it's run the the shucking knife along the top of of this flat part, and that separates it. And there we go, one fantastic oyster. 
So I just take that out, just separate, separate it from the shell. And in it goes. And obviously then I'll give them a wash. Now I've found that it's definitely easier to try and get in with the knife at the back here, the hinge part, than, than it is at, at the front there. But others may have found, diff found uh, different. But I must admit, um, I don't find this easy. Um, it's definitely easier to do uh, scallops, but that one went in quite quite easily. But sometimes it seems to take a while to 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 get the knife in. So once you're in, that's it. Just separate that. So that's the oysters done. Eventually, I must admit, there was a few of them were difficult, difficult to get open, particularly those big Pacific oysters. So a few of those were, were difficult. Some, some came easy and some, some took a bit of time, but I got there in the end. So as I mentioned, I'm going to freeze these down, pop them in the freezer, and then when I'm ready to eat them, I can take them out and cook them. So the idea is that I'm going to cook the scallops and have the scallops as a first course on one day and then on another day cook the oysters and have the oysters as a first course. The ingredients I've got to cook the scallops with are about a tablespoon of olive oil, a couple of cloves of garlic which has been peeled and chopped, about a teaspoon of fresh red chilli chopped, about a tablespoon of fresh coriander chopped, I've got the juice of half a lime and some black pepper and some sea salt. But I'm also going to serve the scallops with some of the seaweed that I gathered. This is cooked, it's crispy seaweed. So what I did was, took some of the seaweed and give it a good wash, then a good dry, and then cut it into pieces, and then shallow fried in olive oil until it, until it turns crispy. And it's a fine line between just turning crispy and then overcooking it and burning it. But it's, it's absolutely delicious cooked. And for those of you that have not never tried cooked seaweed before, it has an irony taste. It takes on an, an irony taste. First, in with the olive oil. And then the scallops. And I'm just gonna cook those, not very long at all, just, just for about a minute and then until they brown one side and then and then flip them over all right that's a minute so just turn them over and then pop in the chili and the garlic And then just cook, the, cook those with the garlic and the chilli for only about another, or oh, just a minute, minute and a half. 
what I don't want to do is, bur is burn the garlic. And then next, in with the lime juice. Bit of salt, bit of black pepper, and then to finish off, a sprinkle of the coriander. And they're now ready to serve. Now for the next treat, the oysters which have been taken out the freezer and thawed ready for me to cook this evening. And the cooking of these is going, is going to be kept very simple. So they're going to be dipped in egg whites and then coated in seasoned flour and then fried in corn oil and then served with a homemade sweet chilli sauce which goes well with a lot of things. For example, goes well with fried squid. But the flour I'm using is not, not the normal flour, it's actually coarse semolina, which I understand is milled, I think it's Durham or Durham wheat. So it's a wheat flour, which is usually used for sweet products, but can also be used as an alternative to breadcrumbs or normal flour when you want to coat things like squid or oysters or fish fillets. And we've been using it now for several years as, as an alternative, and it gives a really nice flavor. Well, as you saw there, I dipped the oysters in the egg whites and coated in the flour. I've got the, the corn oil heated up, so now we're ready to cook. What I'm doing is frying them, just leaving them, leaving them on one side until, and then checking it until we get that that sort of starting to brown up and get and get nice and crispy, and then and then flip them over. Well, I'll take these smaller ones out first. They look done. We pop them, pop them to drain. Just leave these bigger ones a little bit longer. Right, they should be done now. And I'll serve them up. So that's it, so definitely worth me making the effort and taking advantage of those big ties and get out and do a bit of foraging. And particularly pleasing to, to find the four keeper scallops and some fantastic free food. So once again, I hope you found that useful and many, many thanks for watching.